Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We are just waiting for people to get into the room and we will um, get started. So we've got some folks out in the hallway right now. So just. Uh... Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Hurrier and I am the head of the textile arts program at Portland State University. For those of you who are joining us from outside the university today, um, the textile arts program is an elective track in the BFA art practice program that provides an interdisciplinary approach to the study of clothing and textiles. We're excited to host this TC2 panel discussion in conjunction with Portland Textile Month. Um, you can find out more about uh, the PSU textile arts programming that's coming up. Um, this is part of uh, programming that we're doing where we open up our classrooms and um, invite folks in, these wonderful people in to uh, supplement some of our course offerings. And we do lots of events throughout the year. So um, you can check that out at, at the website that I'll be posting. And you can also find out more about uh, text or Portland Textile Month as well. So we'll, we'll post both those links in the chat here in just a second. So um, thank you so much. This is our first ever live stream event uh, that we've ever done. So it's gonna be exciting with the technology. Um, uh, thank you for your patience if we hit some bumps along the way. Um, but uh, yeah, it, we're, we'll um, hopefully, uh, hopefully everything will go just swimmingly. So um, before we get started, I would like to uh, acknowledge that we are joining you from Portland, Oregon, uh, Portland State University, which is located in downtown Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous peoples whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of Chinook, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It's important to acknowledge these ancestors, or the, our ancestors of this place, and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. And remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. It is my great pleasure uh, today to introduce to you all our artist in residence, um, current artist in residence, uh, Lou Bain, Anne Greenwood, and Lila Rowan, who will be facilitating our panel discussion today. Lou, Anne, and Lila came together for the first time in 2021 uh, during an artist residency in rural Oregon, where they found each other um, and shared a spirit of adventure and a multidisciplinary approach to art. Um, from here, they began planning how to collaborate and travel together to the Icelandic textile residency in 2022. Um, Anne, Lou, and Lila wove 20 yards of textiles um, in Iceland that compromises their current or that comprises their current exhibit uh, between now and nowhere, which is currently on view um, upstairs in our MK gallery at Portland State University. So, if you are in um, Portland, we highly encourage you to come by and check it out because it's just it's. Absolutely stunning. So um, today we'll be discussing uh, approaches to working with the TC2 loom and uh, how the technology um, made this traditional practice more accessible, how digital practices have changed the way um, that uh, uh, Lou, Anne, and Lila weave. Um, we'll also be introducing um, our guest panelists, Katarina Schneider, Raga Thor, and Joan uh, Truckenbrod. Um, who are joining us um, all the way from Iceland for the OST textile from the OST textile residency? And so I know it's very late there. Thank you all for for joining us from across the world. Um, Lou, Lila, online, and Anne. I'll let you all take it from here. So oh, thank you. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Um, I just want to make uh, one. Um, little addendum there. Joan Truckenbrod is joining us from Corvallis, Oregon, actually, um, <laughs> just so we know where everybody is. Yeah. Um, and I will uh, take it from here and um, uh, read a couple of bios here, just so everybody knows a little bit about who is on the panel. Uh, Katarina Schneider is a project manager at the Icelandic Textile Center. She oversees communications and correspondence with us artists and residents. Katarina has a master's degree in history, English literature, and language from the University in Freiburg, Germany, 
and a degree in library and information science from the University of Iceland. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Katarina go from here then, and we'll read the bios before each individual presents. Welcome, Katarina. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I think Lila's gonna share my slides for me. Oh, I sure am. Do, 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 there it is. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Just wait for it to come up. Can you all see that? It's loading right now. Loading, I think. It's not up yet. Not quite. Not quite. Can we maybe try one more time? Try again, maybe? It says that my screen sharing is paused. And then when I try to click resume share, it doesn't do anything. Okay, Allison's thinking over here. <laughs> Our Zoom guru. Quick way out. <laughs> We're seeing something. There we go. We're seeing it. Yeah. There's Raga. Okay. There's a there's a different slideshow that I put in that email that is for Katarina. Um I would I would just while I'm pulling it up, Lila, I would try to just share your screen. So okay, yeah. Like there should be music playing. Uh, oh, there okay. we go. Oh, yes. Good. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Get it. Right. Oh, it might. Is it paused again? It's, yeah, it just keeps loading. Also, just do it with the, you know, the other way. Yeah. Yeah, let's Perfect. just do, okay. just try and make this work. Here we go. Okay, thank you so much. Larry, do you think? Yes, perfect. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Katarina Schneider. I'm a project manager at the Textile Center here in Iceland. And I would like to tell you a little bit about what it is that we do. Um, next slide, please. So the Textile Center is a nonprofit institution that was established in 2019. That is the year when the old textile center called Textil Setur established in 2005 and the Blunders Academic Center established in 2012 were merged. Uh, we are located in Kønnarskolen, which is a heritage building and former women's college in Blunders, Northwest Iceland. Uh, the main aim of the textile center is to develop and promote Icelandic and international textiles and textile innovation based on the principles of a circular economy. We are led by a governing board that comprises representatives, of universities, regional municipalities, associations, and businesses. And we have a contract with the Icelandic Ministry of Higher Education, Science, and Innovation. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see where we are located in a small seaside village on the banks of Glacial River Blanda. In the middle, you see Kvenaskolen, the heritage building, textile center. The two houses to the left are also part of it. Um, the building to the right is the Textile Museum, 
which is a separate entity. It's not part of the textile center and the only textile museum in Iceland. Next slide, please. So what is it that we do? There are many textile projects and they're quite diverse. Uh, we work in collaboration, research and innovation in the field of textiles, textile art and design. Uh, we developed education programs and provide facilities for distance learning and supervise exams. We host field schools, student groups and educators, organize textile themed events and community projects such as art exhibitions, lectures, the ice knit fest. And then we run the OS textile Limited residency. Next slide. Thank you. So OS residency provides artists, makers and scholars with space and equipment to create. We have around eight to 14 residents every month who stay for one month or longer, up to three months in shared accommodation in Kvennarskolen or the houses next door, uh, which suits smaller groups or artists looking for a bit more privacy. We have an application and review-based process where artists can apply via an application form on our website and welcome a variety of backgrounds and methods within textiles, including knitting, weaving, surface design, felting, pattern making, etc. Included in a residency is access to the Lund Studio, Dye Studio, shared workspace. And we also offer a special digital looms residency where artists have exclusive access to TC2 for a two or four week sprint. Residencies are self-funded and self-directed, but there is a certain structure. We always start with an artist talk and end with a group exhibition or open house, which is all optional, but most artists choose to take part. We also publish the OS Art Residency Catalogue once a year, where artists and residents and their work are featured. It's a great way to showcase what is going on at the residency and the work that's being created here. It's not for sale, but able for print on demand on Blurb. The next slide, please. Well, there's a picture of our Loom Studio on the third floor of Kornaskolen. Residency exhibitions and open houses are usually held at the end of the month and groups always design their own posters and choose the exhibition location. Next slide. Here's an overview of some of the TC2 artists and residents which, which we have hosted since 2018, which is when we first started offering this residency. We bought our first digital loom in 2016. So some of the names here are probably familiar. They include some of the people present in this lecture today. So yeah, and um, next slide. Uh, the textile center also runs a textile lab, which is in walking distance from Prenderskolen, which you can see here in the background. So this is a maker space for scholars, students, the local community, makers, artists, which was formally opened in May 2021 in connection with an European project that we are doing at the moment in Trino. But this is a space for experimentation, sampling and textile innovation, not fabrication per se. There's a lab manager on site, Margaret, who's a product designer who knows how the equipment works and can offer assistance. And there's certain open days, but the lab is also open by appointment and is a part of the Fab Lab Iceland network. The um, equipment includes two digital looms, TC2, a digital embroidery machine, laser cutter, 3D printer, felt loom, vinyl printer. Um, great news, the digital knitting machine arrived today, this morning, very excited. And then we also have like a small classroom projector situation happening. Uh, next slide. I thought it might be interesting to tell you just a little bit about some of the recent and current projects that the Textile Center is part of. Uh, Bridging Textiles to the Digital Future was a three-year project funded by the Icelandic Research Fund from 2017 to 2020, which we presented at Design March in Reykjavik. It was led by Ragnhildur Björk who was here today as well, our weaving expert. And it was all about digitizing Icelandic, historic Icelandic weaving patterns and making them accessible via an online database. We do uh, wool themed research and activities such as sheep farmers perceptions on wool, 
which was a survey conducted by the University of Iceland in 2020. Utlathon, a wool hackathon idea marathon, where prizes were awarded by the president of Iceland. And then Wool of the North, which is a North Atlantic cooperation funded project about developing wool tours, slow tourism and sheep farming countries in the North, including Greenland and the Faroe Islands. Centrino stands for new centralities in industrial areas as engines for innovation and urban transformation. And is a three and a half uh, year European collaboration funded by Horizon 2020. And is all about developing the textile center as a pub city hub, building a textile lab and conducting research on textile and gender in Iceland. Uh, we were a part of SheMix this year, which is an EU funded project that focuses on innovation as key to bridging the gender gap in the textile and clothing industry. And just started hosting Pub Academy, the Textile Academy program from Barcelona here in Rondos. It will run until April 2023. We host field schools and study visits regularly, including the Iceland Field School at Concordia University in Montreal, students from the Iceland University of the Arts, the Academy of Visual Arts, and others. And then other projects include the Iceland Knitfest that I mentioned before, an Erasmus Plus funded project called Allur, and we're starting a textile cluster in Northwest Iceland. And then we also do projects funded via the Iceland Geek Student Innovation Fund, like Thread Obsession, which was a student-led collaboration with the Iceland Geek Red Cross about reducing textile waste and raising awareness on where our clothes come from and where they go. So there's a lot going on. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, um, here are some images from Bridging Textiles to the Digital Future, Raga's project. The coat on the left was made by fashion designer, Icelandic fashion designer, Gulberg Flora Stefansdóttir, uh, woven on our TC2 and inspired by the old patterns that are now accessible via the online database. Um, you can find that on our website. There's a link here. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah, the city is participating in Centrino, including Blondros and the website to that project. And then the next slide, please. And here are some images from our day to day student group visits, experiments in the textile lab, our Fab Academy students and the local instructor on the top left. And the next slide. And this is our team, small, but very effective. Elsa Adnatos is our director. I'm the project manager and do communications. Margaret, our textile lab manager. Raka, weaving expert. Svana takes care of the Knitfest and Wall of the North. And Louise just joined us as the local instructor for Fabric Academy. Uh, this is our website, and you can find us on Instagram, textilmistress. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katarina. That was so amazing. Do you want to jump into Raga? Seeing the images of the uh, textile lab, so dreamy with the sunset in the back. When we yeah. were there, there were these like two hour long sunsets. It was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're very lucky with the sunsets, that, that's for sure. Okay, I think um, we are going to move on to um, introduce Raga. Um, Raga Thor is an Icelandic textile artist, freelance lecturer, and a weaving specialist at the Textile Center Os Residency in Blondos. Raga has a BA degree in textile from the Icelandic College of Art and Craft. Diploma from Fiberworks, Berkeley, California, and a master's degree in arts education from the in University of Akureyri. Welcome, Raga. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for presenting here. I think we're ready for you next. Okay. Lila, can you put up my slides? Yeah, should I try sharing my screen? We'll try it one time. Yeah. <clears throat> 
thank you very much for for asking me to do this. It's it's an honor. I've never <laughs> taken part in in such a long distance uh, talk or or a conference. So that's something new for me. Okay, so this is something. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this is my crazy name. It's Ragnheiður Björk Þórsdóttir. It's very difficult to pronounce, but I am always called Raga. So everyone is uh, telling, saying my name differently. So yeah. So Raga is my nickname and I'm always called that. But my background, as you told, told them, is uh, in textile. But most of my artistic career, I have been using the weaving as a media, all kinds of weaving, experimental weaving and tapestry weaving. And, and um, I think it was like seven years ago, I came to the textile center for the first time before everything happened when that Katarina was telling you about. I was teaching one of the groups from the fashion department from the University of Arts. That was my first assignment there. And then at some point I saw all the, the old manuscripts of, of the, the old uh, weaving patterns from 1930, 1940, 1950, uh, and also older and newer. So I was completely taken by these manuscripts and I, I kind of I kind of felt like uh, can you have, give me the first slide so you don't want to look at my name all the time mm -hmm. uh, yeah this is my first dig digital weaving but uh, in 2016 we started to think about it would be amazing to take all these old pattern and, and digitize them and put them in a in a database. So that's how it started really. And then also we were thinking about buying a TC2 loom, the first one, the bigger one. And that happened in 2016, or it came in 2015 and I went to Norway in 2016. Uh, of course, I've, I've written book book about weaving. I have been doing, you know, weaving patterns and weaving structures uh, for the last 30 or 40 years or something and teaching all kinds of classes in, in techn technology in weaving, all the, all the, the uh, crazy patterns. So I went to Norway to the, to the factory, the Thondrup Engineering, and worked with Vibeka for like Vibeka Westby, who was the founder of this loan, this amazing tool. And I spent uh, 10 days with her and this, I wanted to show you this small, it's a very, it's just one module by four, I think, in the depth. This is my first digital weaving ever. And then today, it's, it's only like six years ago, but now it's, it, it seems like it's like 100 years ago, because so many things have, have happened since this first crazy, crazy uh, image. Uh, Vibeka wanted me to work from some old photo that I had in my computer. This is just very typical Icelandic deserted valley. It's one of the valleys in the east that used to be uh, a lot of farmers used to live there in the old days in the 19th century and, and before and up to, to 2020 maybe, no, no, 1950 or something. Then people left the valley and I took this photo the only time that I have been there. It's a beautiful valley, but it's very, very remote and difficult to get there. It's in the east of Iceland, so I choose this, this very simple photo to have my first weaving. And uh, can I have the next one, please? Yes, and this is one of my latest. So I'm mixing my slides. And this one is from my private. Uh, this is my, for one of my exhibitions. I, I was exhibiting in Akureyri in 2021, where I live. And now this 
piece is at the textile museum in Blundos, at my solo exhibition that was held this summer and is, is still running. And uh, I, I mean, my my weaving is, you know, I'm I'm going from I have two looms in my studio here in 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 Grenvik where I'm staying now, and I'm always doing tapestry and loom weaving, experimental weaving, and then I'm doing digital weaving uh, at the TC2 loom. So I think it's only for one or two times that I have actually been weaving on the TC2 for myself. Most of the time I have been do doing the research for the textile center, teaching students how to use it or giving courses to people in Iceland, textile people. So I'm running around, you know, from Akureyri to Blantos and to Reykjavik and to, uh, I, I'm teaching weaving in three places in Iceland. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of traveling. And uh, in March 22, I managed to stay at the textile center like an uh, art residency for almost one month. And then I was working on my pieces, you know, so, and I'm still trying to find a time to do that again. <laughs> so next. Next slide. I'm running, you know. Uh, Lentos is very dear to me because I used to live there when I was a child. My grandmother was one of the old teachers at the women's school in Lentos. So this lady, this is one of my, this is the only por portrait that I have ever woven in my, in my entire life. This lady is Haldora Bjarnadóttir. She was born in 1873. And she became 108 years old, and she died in 1981. Uh, she was a friend of my grandmother, and my grandmother gave me a black and white photo of her like 40 or 50 years ago, when I was just still a teenager. She, she gave me this photo. And uh, somehow I decided to weave this photo. So this is a contribute to Haldra Bjarnadóttir. She was always wearing Icelandic national costume. You can see that she is wearing this cap on her head because that's the cap that, that belongs to the national costume of Iceland. And she is wearing her costume and she is wearing her knitted shawl that she was always wearing. I met her several times as a child, but I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that she was 100 years old when I met her, but she was. And last year I was doing, I was working for an exhibition and it was supposed to, the, the theme of the exhibition was text, some kind of text and textile is the same word and textara from, from Greek means textile. So I took a letter that she wrote to describe women's education in Iceland in 1913, which is the first statement of women's education in Iceland. So I took that and I wove it on the TC2 loom, all her text. Her, it's, it's, it's like a curriculum of women's study. And then also uh, the photo that my grandmother gave me. So I decided to weave her. And next slide. So I'm running around from my personal career and to the textile center. This is also just one small piece of my research uh, in weaving. It's just, in fact, it is my left eye, but it's not supposed to be my left eye. You know, the, the image is from my eye, but it, I, it's reversed. So it's just some something playing around with colors and, and some shades and gradient scale. And the next one. And uh, now I'm going back to my, my uh, work at the textile center. Uh, my research that Katarina was telling you about, bridging textile to a digital future, was all about digitizing the old manuscripts of the patterns, which is now in our database. I think we digitized like 2000 patterns, uh, several hundred pages of written, handwritten uh, manuscripts, uh, all kinds of patterns, project notes, and, you know, all kinds of mostly domestic textile fabrics, uh, 
uh, tablecloths, all kinds of things that we used to weave because we had we used to be very sustainable and nice that we wove everything that we used for the for our household. And we took uh, a lot of these old patterns and we it transferred them into, we put them into Photoshop and transferred them into weaving files and wove sample weaving on the TC2. And me and my assistant, we've made like, I think it was 110 samples. And the textile center has all these samples. Took us like, the, the whole project was like three years, almost four. And we took one and a half year in weaving all these samples whenever we could have the chance to work on the loom because the loom was rented to, to artists a lot of the time, but we took like some months that we could use to, to finish our research and finish our study of bridging. Bridging textile was, the thinking was that we were going to make a bridge uh, from the old weaving of Iceland to the new digitized world. That was our goal. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of learning experience. It was a lot of uh, playing around with all kinds of material and uh, putting together different patterns and different shades. And it was just a lot of, yeah, we learned a lot. It was something completely new for me because I had always been working on with all these weaving softwares like uh, Weavepoint and uh, Fiberworks and all these these softwares for computers, but I had never been using Photoshop to do my weaving structures before. So that was my, I have only been doing this for like six years. So next slide, this is one of our samples. And there you can see the same sample that Katarina showed you. And I, when I look at this photo, it's like one, two, three, four, it's like five samples there together. And I still can remember which is what, you know, from what page in our manuscript, the, the one in the, the, the bottom left, it's like, uh, it's a twill weaving. And so we, we took all kinds of, of weaving patterns and just mixed them together. Okay, next one. Uh, and then the, the project or the, this research pro project was, we finished it in 2020 and we took, uh, we took part in the, the design marts in Iceland in 2020. And then we exhibited a lot of our samples. We exhibited this code that we wove. And the, this code is, is, the file is made from like, I think it's like four different twill patterns from the Icelandic, the first Icelandic, uh, uh, it was like a lexicon of weaving that was, was published in 1948. And we took like three, uh, 12 patterns from that book and two from the manuscript and put them together and make made crazy files and wove this, and we wove this fabric. The di design is by Thora Stephens, who is a fashion designer and a printmaker. And we still have this coat at the textile museum, the te textile center. And it's very heavy because we made like big files with four colors. And because the density of, of the loom, the big loom is, we can only have like, uh, what is it? 12 threads per centimeter, that's like, 30 in and, and grains. So it's quite thick fabric. Okay, next one. Yes, and this is also just one of our experiment where we are experimenting how to thin the warp. This is like, this is just an old pattern that we found in one of the books, one of the manuscripts. It's a lace. It's an old lace technique in weaving and we had to thin the warp more than 50%. I think it's only like eight threads, 16, 20 threads per inch in this weaving. So it, it has been a lot of playing around. And for me personally, it has been a 
a very interesting journey that was completely, I came to accidentally because uh, this didn't exist. I think when in 2010, I was uh, thinking about going to Norway and learning this. I, the textile center was not in my mind because I was teaching at one of the colleges in, in Akureyri, weaving. Um, I was teaching weaving there for 30 years. So I had been contacting Vibeka for many years and I was following her research and following her uh, project of this, this TC2 loom. So I knew about it, but I never thought that I would ever learn to use it. So it was complete coincidence and accident that I went into this uh, teaching, one week teaching period at the textile center in 2014. And the snowball has always been getting bigger and bigger. So it was, yeah, it has been uh, great fun. And I, Sometimes when I'm weaving at the TC2, I miss my old loom, you know, because the noise in the TC2 is very, it's, it's, the noise is very heavy and, and, and difficult for me to bear. So, but it's always a lot of fun to work on the TC2. So, yeah, isn't this the, the last slide? Or is it maybe one? Yeah, okay. I think this this is it. I'm just running around from from my career to my teaching pro, to my work at the textile center. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Raga. Um, that was very interesting to learn how um, how uh, how you got into weaving and how. Um, things have progressed for you. Um, mm -hmm. We have one more artist who's going to speak about their work uh, uh, from Portland, Oregon. Joan Truckenbrad is a digital artist propelling digital imagery into textiles. She has an MFA degree in digital art from the Art Institute of Chicago. Her work is in a number of museum collections. She is a professor Professor Emitris uh, at the Art and Technology Department of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and has relocated to Oregon. Um, welcome, Joan. Let's see if we you. have your images. Um, you can go ahead and show yours if you want. Um, I think we've got yours, right, Lila? Are you finding those? I think I'm the last one. There. Okay, there we go. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be part of this um, amazing group of people, uh, creative artists who are working on the TC2 loom. I'm a digital, you could go to the first slide, please. I'm a digital artist by background um, and have always been frustrated by the imagery or the artwork being locked in the computer. So the issue of propelling the imagery out of the computer into a material presence has always been important to me. So I brought a couple, I'm showing you a couple of early works that are also textiles, but not weavings to sort of contextualize um, my current my current work with the TC2. So this is from 1978. Um, it's programmed, it's a coded algorithmic textile. It's 84 inches high and 60 inches wide. And it's um, color Xerox heat transfer on polyester. So how I, how I created this, I was working with formulas that describe phenomena in the natural world that are invisible, like light waves and how they reflect off of irregular surfaces and wind patterns. So in this textile, I created a series of images that reflects that uh, sort of fluid motion um, and sort of like an animation and displayed each image one at a time on the monitor. And at this point I was working with the Apple computer. So 
little boxes that you can see um, are actually the apple only had eight colors and each pixel was a little a little box but so I would display these images one at a time on the computer monitor and then I had access to a 3m color and color copier with a backlight setting that would understand the picture on the monitor so I turned the monitor upside down on the copy machine and for each image I made for each image in the series I made a heat transfer print then I trimmed the prints down and hand ironed them back onto polyester. I had to use polyester because the dyes on these heat transfers were micro encapsulated and, and needed to go on a polyester fabric. So you can see how many images um, I transferred onto this uh, polyester fabric. The, actually, the panel is two strips of polyester uh, fabric wide. So and I preferred them to be hung out in a gallery so that they moved with the air currents. I felt I was kind of returning uh, this natural phenomena back into the world. So the next, you could go to the next slide, please. And then I had, um, there, 3M had a, a scan a mural process that was used for making murals. And at this point I was working on a higher resolution computer computer. This is also a programmed images image. I programmed at that time in Fortran. This is 1982. And this is a canvas textile. It's 73 inches wide by 43 inches high. Um, and it was it, I would transfer it then to 3M who would then create this. And I was interested in again, the fluidity of, of natural phenomena and I used color fields in the background so that the color of the elements actually changed based on the character of the background. So let's go to the next one. And now um, I have access to, I have my own TC2 loom. Um, and this was really a catalyst for me in terms of this intersection of the digital and the materiality of the natural world. This is called churning geometries and it's 54 inches wide, 22 inches high. It's mercerized cotton from 2018. It was on one of my first uh, woven pieces. And what it actually is, is blowing bubbles. It's a, a video still from, that was captured in a big tub of soap bubbles. And so you can see the structure that is present and the geometry that's present in um, soap films. So that it was quite interesting for me. So you go to the next slide, please. This one's called Catalyst Portal. It's from 2020. It's 55 inches wide, 45 inches high. And this one is cotton, linen, and bamboo. I started experimenting with different fibers so that I changed the character of the surface texture. And I like to juxtapose different types of imagery. Um, so in this one, in the, in the upper portion of the image is um, the pattern that a river makes as it moves through the countryside or through a valley and how it carves out new paths. So you can see that the main river is carving out little new little paths in this one. And it's contrast with in the lower portion, um, very dry, crusty, um, cracked earth on the playa um, in Summer Lake, Oregon, when in the summer when the lake dries up. I, I photographed that during a residency at Playa. So, so I'm contrasting the very fluid, uh, and, and this does bring to the forefront the issue of uh, the crisis in, in water um, and rivers uh, throughout the country um, today, and particularly in Southern Oregon, of course. You could go to the next slide. I, I, I seem to disrupt the weaving process. I, I like the, the sort of contrast and juxtaposition of imagery. So as you all know, you don't really see exactly the image on the screen as you're weaving. So it unfolds. And then 
I like to change colors and in some cases um, bring in different structures throughout the weaving. So this was woven, of course, horizontally, but I chose to hang it uh, vertically. So this one is 22 inches wide and 54 inches high, again, uh, with uh, mercerized cotton. And the imagery, there's a combination of imagery here. On the left-hand side, it's imagery of decaying leaves, and it's woven in three colors. And then on the right-hand side, um, well, you see the color bars as well. It's woven in four colors. And then to create this sort of, uh, actually to push the viewer to try to understand what is being communicated here, there's a small strip of the first image that you saw, the churning geog geometries image is there. Next slide, please. So this is um, one that was fascinating to me. And you saw early on a, an image woven with one color. This one is called Dawn and it's woven with a white warp and black linen thread. This one is 55 inches wide and 13 inches high. And so I normally love color. And so challenging myself to do something um, to articulate form and space with only one color was the challenge here. Could you go to the next slide, please? And there's a detail of this. So this is an image, I think I said, of uh, waves on the beach in Oregon. And, I, and as I wove this, I became sort of amazed at how it began to look very detailed, uh, very much like lace. Next slide, please. This one is called Wave Pulse. And, and you, you can see um, my sort of uh, motivation or my, uh, the pressure I put on myself to explore different imagery within one textile. So there's imagery of snow in one of the snowy mornings in Oregon where the, it was in the winter where there were no leaves on the trees. So the branches were all dark and then there was snow on the branches. So there's that contrast of an image in this one. And then in the middle is um, broken ice, ice shards on the Chicago River that were photographed from the Michigan Avenue Bridge. <laughs> so um, we have this sort of contrast of, of shape and form and then a shift in color as well. This one, I believe this is three colors. And this is cotton linen also in bamboo. And this is 2019. So you can go to the next one. This one is an experiment with metallic thread, which is really difficult to my, to my amazement, is really difficult to photograph. On the left-hand side, there's a, um, there's a pinkish coral color metallic thread. And on the, so it goes from a very highly structured environment to in the middle is the river imagery again. So there's a flow um, and a depth in the center area. And then on the right hand side is the intimacy of a, an image of lichens. When I moved to Oregon, I was absolutely astounded at the incredible beauty of the range of lichens that exist here that do not exist in the Midwest. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I worked a lot with that as well. And the threads here are the metallic thread. And then I also used a merino wrapped uh, with silk, the Habu um, textile, and also silk and silk and stainless steel on this one. So next slide, please. This is a detail. Um, this one is 54 inches wide and only 14 inches high. And on the, on the upper portion is, this is about an urban environment. And on the upper portion is the sort of organic distorted flow of a, um, a fence, like an iron fence. And on the bottom portion are windows in an older, older building. So I have this, again, the organic character with um, 
the more rigid character. And I, I like to leave my, the trials on the bottom here, you can see the experiment with color. It's like giving people access to my thinking a little bit and my process. And I don't always hem things. So here you see um, the black warp at the lower portion. And on the right-hand sides, I usually also leave some of the threads just so that the rigidity of the weaving is um, disrupted a bit. Next slide, please. So this is my new, um, this one, this is a cell picture in my studio. So you're, you're actually not seeing the contrast uh, as, as well. It's called mycelium. I'm, I have the opportunity to work with um, fungi dye. And it's not dye from boiling up mushrooms like a normal way that you might make natural dyes. It's a dye that the fungi produce in the lab, in a scientific lab. So the interesting thing about these, uh, they're sort of new discoveries and there are discoveries in Europe as well that's using bacteria to create color that can be used to um, dye textiles. So um, I have this dye, it's, it has to be diluted. And what I'm doing is I'm using a thick and thin, it has to go on polyester for the best coloration, but I'm, it's a red dye, but I'm only getting pink from this. So I have a thick and thin polyester yarn or thread, and I'm literally painting the dye onto, onto the thread. It's because polyester is not absorbent. So um, it's not like I could dip the polyester thread into the dye. So the striations that you see here in this textile are the pink um, thick and thin polyester thread that is dyed with uh, the fungi dye. And the interesting thing about this dye, and I'm, I'm moving more in that direction so that I can um, use all of the colors from uh, the fungi. I now have blue that I'm starting with, but they, they're, they're non-polluting. They don't require water like a normal dye process. Uh, they're sustainable because um, when they get, they're not in industrial production yet, but it, conceptually that's where they're headed and it's possible. So they're sustainable and they're environmentally safe. They're not creating any, any pollution. So it's a, it's a really valuable and important direction, I think, in the textile industry. So I'm combining this polyester thread uh, with silk and silk and stainless steel. So the other colors of yarn or thread, there's the pink from the fungi dye, there's a yellow silk and stainless, there's a red um, silk thread, and then there is a purple hemp thread. <laughs> so on the bottom again, you can see my color testing. Um, that goes on and, and you, on the sides, you can also see the loose threads as if it were going to unravel. The imagery here is, um, I'm, I'm trying to envision this mycelium like underground where these, uh, these organisms are interdependent, where there's this very complex interaction among um, the fungi and the trees and, and other underground um, organisms. And they have now discovered that there is some kind of communication pattern between these organisms. They have discovered um, electric spikes that are occurring and they're interpreting this, the researchers are interpreting this as communication patterns and, and a actually a language. So they have documented these uh, electric spikes. So the, the imagery that you see in terms of the spiking, they're the subtle yellowish in the lower left and then in, in, um, in the lighter colors on the darker areas is actually their diagram. So I've in, 
incorporated their diagrams uh, into these, into this textile, which is the first in hopefully a series. I think there's one more slide of the detail. Lila, do you have that? Yeah, this is a detail so you can see. And here you see a little bit of the yellow and a little bit of, of the red, but there are pathways also moving through this, um, this particular textile. So I, for me, I think the research in terms of using new dyes uh, that are sustainable um, is important. So, so in conclusion, I'm just um, invigorated, I guess you'd say, by ideas that hopefully I'll have uh, time to bring about um, through this combination of uh, working with the computer and then working with the digital loom. So thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, it was very exciting to see your work and uh, hear about the history of your work with digital media. Um, let's see, I think we're going to move on to um, the work that's upstairs in the MK gallery, um, created by Lou Bain, um, Lila Rowan, and myself. Um, Let's see, I'm just gonna open up here. Um, what's that? Okay, okay so um, yeah, Allison read our bio and um, Lou and Lila and I have uh, been collaborating here together for a little over a year, year and a half. Um, Lila and I have a longer history of working together. We met um, when I was doing a residency at the uh, Portland Garment Factory where she was the production manager. Um, and we shared a studio together here in Portland up until uh, we returned from Iceland. And then she moved to Hawaii. So um, <laughs> our collaboration is taking a new form. Um, but we will show you some of the work uh, that's upstairs in the gallery now. And side note, we met Lou at Playa Summer Lake, where Joan had a piece. Um, one of your pieces was about the landscape there. So exactly. anyways. Yeah, Oregon artists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. That's great. Sorry. You so this, first? yeah, this is our like absolute collaboration. Um, we all kind of came to digital weaving from different backgrounds, and um, we all I think were exceptionally inspired by the landscape while we were in Iceland. And so um, we came together and this is our collaboration where we took three images that we were all kind of like working separately with and combined them to create this um, landscape, uh, this Kapirso in Ava landscape. And all of the yarn in here, all of the cottons and silks were hand dyed with natural um, dyes from Lila. Um, she did an excellent job creating all these vibrant colors. And then we included some of the local lopi wool into um, this particular weaving. Um, so it has this really rich, beautiful, kind of like fuzzy, dense. Um, yep, and this is a large piece. It's, it's hanging in the center of the room upstairs. It's probably 42 inches by 80, something yeah. like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, Lila, did you want to add anything to this? Um, if you get kind of close to it up in the gallery, uh, you can smell the lopi wool that um, is unspun, like roving from Iceland that they just knit with there. Um, and it, we just like doing that because it reminds us of being in Iceland, smelling it. <laughs> I don't right. know. Go smell the weed. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, don't touch it, but smell it. <laughs> or don't tell anybody if you touch it. 
And so this piece is woven on a, on a black warp and um, the top portion of the image is um, hand-drawn lines. Um, uh, I drew several pictures of the Arctic Turn while we were in Iceland. They were migrating in to the region we were um, at that time. And so I was uh, practicing, um, yeah, incorporating some hand-drawn imagery into the digital media. Uh, should we try the next next slide? And here you can see the back side of this weaving. You can see the, the black warp. Next slide. So this is one of my pieces. Um, we, when we were, we traveled for eight days in Iceland before we started the residency. And we all kind of brought some different ideas and things like that from our previous works. And so I oftentimes use um, infographics and kind of scientific information um, from my, that I'm interested in. And because we were in Iceland, I was looking at magnetic um, poles. It was the closest to that I'd personally ever been to the, one of the poles of our planet. So um, I was interested in incorporating some of those kind of like um, graphics and things like that into the landscape. And so I kind of chose a handful of different kind of iconic landscapes that we experienced. And this one is a sulfur mound. We walked through these um, billowing clouds of bubbling earth through these like sulfuric uh, landscapes. Um, and so I kind of did these quasi abstracted um, landscape interpretations was kind of what I was working on while I was there. Um, this was another um, piece where I I worked predominantly from um, photographs and things like that, and then manipulated them in Photoshop. And this was just a test that I was kind of not super into. And so I decided to cut into this. Usually after weaving cloth, it, it feels so precious that you don't want to cut into it and manipulate it and stitch into it just because it feels like your cuttings, a child in half or something. <laughs> um, but I felt like I, I we'd just seen a, a show recently with another weaver who was kind of like really experimenting with um, cloth. And so I was trying to get myself to think of it as just cloth. And so I kind of cut it up and sewed it and embroidered on it. Um, and this piece is called um, Similar Orbits. And it was just kind of thinking about our experience um, in Iceland and um, space and things like that. So that's how I came up with this piece. Um, let's go to the next one. Diane. Um, yeah, and I, I have uh, a background in photography. My undergraduate work um, was photography and um, interdisciplinary studies. Um, and so working with the, the TC2 loom um, was of interest to me. I was introduced to it in 2018 when I went to the Icelandic textile residency for the first time. I saw the TC2 and started learning a little bit about it. Um, met Raga at that time. And um, <clears throat> probably for the last 20 years, I've been working in textiles and uh, moved away from photography entirely. And so um, working on the TC2 loom uh, was a way for me to bring both of these uh, media together. And these images that you're looking at here are called emerging patterns. They're two weavings that were woven side by side and cut apart. Um, they are images of uh, fungal patterns and woven with um, lo uh, logwood dyed uh, cotton fiber and uh, indigo Osage um, uh, cotton fiber. Um, and yeah, they're probably uh, 20, 20 inches by 22 inches. Um, next slide. And uh, this is a combination of pieces. Um, 
as Lou was describing, um, taking the raw woven textile and cutting it apart uh, was a challenge. And these were pieces that I wove um, that I had intended to cut apart. Um, and I often make limited editions of artists' books, uh, sometimes in fabric or paper, but they generally have a relationship to textiles. Um, and so I'm, you know, very new to weaving. This is absolutely the first time I've ever woven anything. Um, and uh, going into this, um, yeah, I felt super vulnerable learning a new uh, medium and um, going to Iceland, the three of us collaborating together. Um, you know, I have a history of collaboration in my practice. I do quite a bit of community engaged work, um, either public art or um, social practices. And so I approached this um, opportunity uh, as a collaborative moment where um, I could really, you know, depend on Lou and Lila to uh, share with me their previous knowledge of weaving um, and I could learn from them. And so we spent hours together at the computer, um, Lou, you know, agonizing over teaching me Photoshop, which it was not agony. <laughs> I had really let go of in terms of um, knowing how to use. And so uh, these pieces here are, um, yeah, they are woven from, or they are cut from large panels. Um, the, the very brightly colored pieces are, um, you know, all naturally dyed. And it was an experiment for me to uh, weave with some text. And so um, currently all of these uh, pages, there are, um, gosh, I think there are about 42 pages total, will go into an edition of fabric books. The plan is to make uh, between four and 10 fabric books. I haven't decided on the number of pages in each book and, and what will be assembled with them, but this is, this is a work in progress. Next slide. Okay, this is one more image of mine. Um, this is, uh, so I arrived in Iceland kind of wanting to work from imagery that I had brought along with me. I, I did do some photographing while I was there, but most of the imagery I worked with was um, material that I had photographed um, before uh, going to Iceland. And this is some uh, lichen imagery um, that is, uh, I think it's the indigo dyed fibers and the Osage. Um, and so this was just, uh, you know, three different images of, of lichen that were um, doctored in Photoshop and woven probably 42 inches by, I don't know, 32. And um, yeah, all of our work, we were, I think, each in, interested in finishing our work in different ways and exhibiting the pieces um, differently and just really exploring a range of opportunities. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, so this is the first weaving that I wove on the TC2 um, and had got me interested in the TC2 and it just sounded complicated and interesting and I wanted to learn about it. And then we met Lou and she has a lot of experience with the TC2 and agreed to go to Eisen with us. So then I took a class from Catherine Amade at Praxis and I didn't realize how much information I was actually getting from that class until we got to Iceland and it all kind of clicked um, once I saw the loom and Lou started teaching us how to use it. <clears throat> um, but yeah, these are images of water coming onto the shore. 
and um, <clears throat> there's an orange and blue weft and I had wanted more blue to show. And that was just kind of one of the things in the learning process where um, the blue really doesn't show at all, but it still turned out successful. And yeah, just thinking about moments and time and the experience of watching the waves come in and out. Um, next slide. And this was the last weaving that I did and tried to get a little ambitious here with doing a um, two weft weave, but changing the colors partway through. And um, yeah, all of the colors except for the black were uh, dyed with natural materials. And this is some imagery of um, a pile of boulders by the Black Sand Beach in Southern Iceland. And um, the clouds were originally just white, but then I tried to um, mix in the colors of the beautiful sunsets that we were seeing up in Northern Iceland when we were at the residency and how the um, color of the sunset lights up the clouds and yeah so that is this piece and when we were down in southern Iceland looking out the Atlantic I was just tripping out over how the whole Atlantic was below us and I probably annoyed Anne and Lou being like but you guys like the whole Atlantic like all of the United States like all of Africa it's all down there <clears throat> Um, so I just trying to capture that amazement. Um, next slide. And this was, <clears throat> I think one of the second weavings that I did after I did the first one and the blue didn't show, I was kind of frustrated and thought, well, I'll just go with a single weft weave and I'll just do it all pink and I'll just see what it looks like to do one color and then I got you know like a few inches up and then realized wow that's going to be a lot of pink I should probably throw in a different color and then just had this liberating experience of throwing in different colors kind of as I felt uh I wanted to, which was this really cool experience because there's so much creativity that goes into <clears throat> creating the image and then creating the file is just this like infinite amount of creativity. And so then being able to realize that like, because then once you get down to the loom and you're just throwing the shuttles, it's a little repetitive, which is something that I enjoy, but it was really liberating to realize that like, oh, I can just throw in whatever color I want. I don't need to stick with the plan. Um, and yeah, that's the last slide. Um, we had had some videos to show that kind of showed the process from like making the file to threading the loom and weaving it and taking it off. But um, I sent those to Allison and to Lou and Anne, but it might be a little too complicated. Um, my screen sharing for some reason isn't working, but we can scrap that and just go to the Q and A if we're ready for that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, I know we we didn't show a lot of images um, for people who aren't familiar with this process, so please feel free to ask whatever questions you have um, regarding what this process is like. You know, Lila alluded a little bit to the complexity and creativity that goes into the file making. And that is a, an entirely um, separate conversation almost because it's so deep and broad. But um, okay, let's, uh, how should we facilitate the Q&A? Um, Would you all like people to ask things yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe we should just go ahead and um, have people unmute themselves and 
Um, actually, my recommendation would be, um, I think if you've got, uh, if you would like to unmute yourself, um, just to go ahead and write your name in the chat and we'll call on you just because it gets a little crazy with everybody trying to ask questions at the same time. Um, or you can also type your, um, type everything into the chat. So, um, so yeah, feel free to use the chat to type your questions or if you'd like to unmute to go ahead and just uh, type your, your name in the chat. Well, I guess I wonder if any of you have questions for each other um, yeah. on the panel. Like yeah. maybe we yeah. can start there too. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we'll we do have a question here. Let's we'll we'll just pause on that and and kind of cover any questions for each other. Joan, Raga, um, yeah, I think uh, Katarina is no longer with us. But uh, does anybody have any questions for each other on the panel? Go for it, John. Yeah. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to go to Iceland, but um, as I can imagine, and then looking at your work, those of you who have been there, uh, the environment is so inspiring and the politics there are inspiring. So um, how did, did you apply and then what time of year did you go and how? Okay. How, yeah. how did you work there if there's, did you have two looms or how did you share the time? And what about the warping? Cause that, you know, that takes a long time. Yeah. Did you take yeah. your warp with you? Were you all ready to go or? Okay. Yeah. 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 Do you want go ahead and start and then we can all jump in. We um, pre-wound 20 yards of warp, of cotton warp. Um, and we started, we traveled for eight days, then we got to the residency and started like that day, which was kind of like jarring to go from like, oh my gosh, we're in this magical wonderland to be like, okay, so we're on thread number one, you know, like it was very kind of crazy to do that switch. Um, but we brought um, 20 yards worth of um, cotton warp. And then we also brought all Lila dyed, I don't even know how many pounds worth of cotton and silk um, before we went there. So we had two suitcases that were just filled with fibers. Um, there's two looms. And so then we got onto like a rotation once we got started where um, whoever had their image set started first. And so one person would be weaving um, for like a day and change. And um, the other two people would be making dinner and making sure that person was fed and <laughs> sleeping and well cared for um, while also um, getting ready and prepping their files and things like that. So we were on a three day rotation where we got to um, leave for a day and then have two days off and then jump back in and leave again. Yeah, and so we were just working on one loom um, and uh, Yes, we applied to the residency. There's a there's an application process online. Um, we went in April for the whole month of April. Uh, we stayed in one of the smaller units outside of the, the women's college. The first time I stayed in kind of the dormitory, uh, Kavenis Gallen. Um, but this time, since there were three of us, we shared one of the smaller houses. Um, and uh, yeah, like Lou said, we went, we wove on kind of a three day cycle. Um, swimming is also a, a very important activity in Iceland as Raga can confirm. <laughs> and so that was one of our off day um, activities too, was we would go to the pool and um, do hot and cold plunge and swim laps and um, just have kind of a spa day, yeah. Did we miss anything? Were there any other questions that you had? It just sounds like it'd be better to go with a small group of people um, in mm -hmm. terms of helping with each other with the warp and yeah. Okay. Exactly, you. it was, yeah, it was a great experience for us. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, Raga, did you have questions or, or wanna? No, no, I just wanted to, uh, I, I didn't know what, how you were gonna explain the, the two looms we have, one is for renting for the artist and the other one is rented on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. 
the, the smaller loom always has a, a warp on it and we just rent it to people, artists in residency or just people from Iceland. They just come for one or two or three days or whatever and they weave some meters and they just pay, pay by the meter. So that loom is almost always uh, accessible. If you stay for one month, you can always be sure that you can access it for at least two or three or four days or something. And, and then if you yeah. want to rent, yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I thought, well, you can also, can you hire um, Margaret to to warp the loom for you if, if that's not something you want uh, to take on? I don't think Margaret has any time. I used to do it before. Uh, in the old days, you know, I used to sometimes warp the loom for people, put on the warp for the people, but it's just too kind of time consuming. Then we would have to charge people yeah. for doing that for them. Of course, we can do it if, if we are supposed to be, if that's just one of our, our job there is to warp the loom, then people would have to pay for it. Yeah. But most of the artists just come to the residency with their own warp. And we can always assist people to put the warp on the loom, me okay. or Margaret or whatever people are around there. We try to assist, but we are not always available. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Cordy was asking, seems like the digital loom opens up a lot of possibilities for weaving. Is there any capability that you feel might be lost or dulled by the shift from analog to digital? Uh, maybe each panelist can take a step or anybody who wants to take a step at that. I mean, I'll take a stab. I am so new to weaving, but um, I do feel like um, I wouldn't necessarily say dulled by making the, sh the shift. I would say that sometimes that is where the creative window occurs, you know, is um, uh, in that transference of information. Um, there are so many different ways to um, explore how that transition looks, you know? Um, so I don't know if Lou, you wanna. Well, the great thing with the TC2 is it sounds, it's, whenever people talk about digital weaving, oftentimes people confuse it with like industrial weaving where your your hand is not in the process, um, but you can use a TC2 just like you would a floor loom where you incorporate traditional um, weaving patterns and traditional practices. Um, you just don't have to deal with threading each, um, you don't have to deal with the threading process. The threading just goes on once. Um, so it kind of brings um, a freedom of labor in that sense. The, the amount of labor that goes into threading the loom is quite a bit, but um, there's a freedom to jump between doing crazy digital images and then also just going back to traditional woven practices. So it's really versatile. Yeah, I think that it is confusing calling it a digital loom because it is still completely operated by the user. And even though it's digital, you're still programming it to weave the way that you want to weave. It's not like the loom isn't really doing anything for you. It's just a tool that, I don't know, it's kind of a confusing thing. But I think Raga had mentioned that one difference was the sound, which I haven't woven on a floor loom before, but there does seem to be something kind of like rhythmic and uh, beautiful and old school about using a floor loom and all of that. And with the TC2, um, the way that the heddles are lifted is by an air compressor. And so you do hear the air compressor, um, but just put on headphones and it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, and I would just say there's so many points during the creative process that you can intervene. It's not like set in stone. Um, there's a lot of decisions, creative decisions you make in preparing the image and then and you transfer it to, to, the, to the computer that controls the loom. 
there's also, you know, many different things that you can change. I changed during my uh, weaving pro and you can also change the image. It's just, it's a phenomenal tool. It's a really interesting uh, intersection of analog and digital. Um, and I'm not a weaver by background. That's why I showed some of the, I'm more of a digital artist. So for me, it's been a really uh, invigorating and opening up process to also engage with this whole issue of materiality. I, I actually just want to bounce off that question and we will get to the other two, but um, I'm curious, um, just based on what you all are talking about, um, I think one of the things for me, like I, um, I am fairly new to weaving um, and definitely very new to like learning more about the TC2, but uh, I draw a lot and I feel like whenever I'm drawing from images, I'm always learning about the images because I, I really strongly believe that drawing is essentially another way of seeing. And I'm wondering for all of you that are working with images, like, do you learn, like, are there things that you learn about the images that make you see them in a different way through the weaving process? Does that make sense? Like, is it like the act of weaving it, does that, does that have the same effect? And and then also I'm curious for you all, like what is it to, to have the images be cloth or to be like, why is that interesting or important to you? Those are like two related questions that I was curious about. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, just off the top of my head, um, you know, like I mentioned before that I wanted to incorporate some hand drawn imagery into my weaving and so when I was weaving the top half of that collaborative piece, um, I was using this lopy fiber, which is a much thicker, um, uh, more raw material. And so the, the, the drawing part of the image was actually kind of raised up, you know, it was like embossed almost. So there's kind of a textural element that um, the, the variation in fibers can allow for. And, um, and also I think transferring um, something digital, whether it's a photograph or um, you know, a hand drawn image that's been scanned in, um, I think bringing it to uh, fibers material, um, it, really, it really changes because it, it has the whole history of um, textiles behind it, you know, so it can be, it can be cut up and it can be changed and it can be worn and it can be folded and it can be, you can interact with it, um, with your body in ways that you can't a paper piece. It, that's just what I thought of. Yeah. And I think the, um, working with digital images is always fascinating. And like Joan was saying, um, you only really see about 12 inches maybe and that's generous of your image that's kind of like being woven at a time and my interest in like seeing um images kind of translated into textiles is it's always it's never what you think it's going to be like be between the because you do all this planning kind of to make sure that you're you, you do color tests you do structure tests you do all sorts of testing to kind of see um, understand conceptually what it's going to look like, but when it's all said and done, there's the thickness of the, the yarn that you're using, your mood and how much you're compacting the loom that day, and there's so many contributing factors that end up abstracting um, your imagery in a way that um, can be really surprising sometimes. Um, and so I feel like that that's kind of like part of the interesting artistic practice with it is um, you are kind of going with the flow and seeing what you're getting. And um, I don't know, I find that to be really exciting just because sometimes it's a disappointment and it's not what you thought it was gonna look like, which is fine because it's textiles and like Anne was saying, you can cut it up and reinvent it and do all sorts of different things. Um, but then other times you get these really lovely surprises with color mixing or with, um, you know, weave structures that kind of work together in a way that was unexpected uh, when they're kind of butted up to one next to each other. Um, so I think that that is kind of um, a really exciting element of working with the TC2. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm still kind of wrapping my brain around the 
effect of translating an image into a TC2 weaving, as Lou said, it comes out so different. And as Anne said, the color of the, or the size of the yarn affects the weight of the line and the aspect ratio. And there's just such a crazy amount that you can do to an image to make it look like it originally did or completely different. And um, yeah, still wrapping my brain around that, but it's very exciting. And um, other thing of like seeing it, how I got into textiles really at this point, I've realized is like, because the community of all the, I've, I dabble in a bunch of different mediums and I found that textile people are my people and I relate to them so much more. And that's kind of why I've like landed on it as a medium is because of the community. And um, I like soft things. And Lou once mentioned that textiles are the best because they're so easy to transport. Like you just fold them up and there you go. It's not this like precious painting that you need to pack a certain way. And it's just a very, accessible and easy and I like that it can be very conceptual and also very um just for fun or something and just about the material yeah I I I agree I mean it textiles really relate to the body differently than other art forms I think and that's really interesting to me and this issue of the crossover to the natural world not only with imagery but with with um, materials we're all talking about using natural dyes and natural fibers which is um, really interesting but also you mentioned drawing Allison um, while we're weaving it's almost like drawing like in Photoshop you can attach a pattern or an image to the pen but during the weaving process, we're doing the same thing by changing colors, by changing imagery. Um, yeah, so it's, for me, it's almost like it's analogous to drawing um, with a pen, but you're doing it with the, with the loom. So it's really quite curious. Raga, yeah, do, do you wanna say anything? Uh, yes, I mean, I've been weaving for like, 35 years and uh, drawing and watercoloring and sketching has always been a big part of my process and big part of my, my study as an artist. So uh, I think I'm always quite uh, rather clear what I'm gonna do when I'm, when I'm trying to do my files for the, for the TC2 loom. It's not that different from tapestry weaving or doing experimental weaving on a on a uh, floor loom so but for me the thread is my pencil you know when i'm weaving it's like i'm drawing so uh, it's always on the back of my mind is always uh, uh, how my image is going to to look when I have woven it. So it's always quite clear. So I always try to have a very clear image and then I start doing my files and then I choose my colors and my, my uh, warp and weft. And of course, there's always this uh, X factor, you know, when you weave, something comes out completely different. Sometimes it's a it's just you will you get very disappointed and sometimes you get very happy because of the transformation of the of this different material you're using. But uh, I would never I think I would never just sit on my loom and start to weave unless I had some kind of plan in my head or some kind of sketch or watercolor or whatever I'm working from. So I, it's always a combination of my hand and my brain, you know, something like that, if you know what I mean, if you understand me. Yes, thank you. Okay, You're let's welcome. see, we have um, a question from, uh, let's see, what resources do you recommend for learning to use the TC2 loom? Also, 
Thank you so much for this presentation. As a new TC2 weaver, it's very reassuring to hear about your experiences. Yay, thank you. Um, Lila, do you wanna take that one or, or Joan? Um, I would recommend, <clears throat> I started with taking a online class through the Praxis Fiber Workshop with Catherine Amade and she knows an insane amount about the loom and I think that's a really great place to start also if you can find somebody who um you know who you can talk to about it is also just really helpful like having Lou was a total blessing because Lou is also very experienced and um yeah I don't know trailing off those two things try to find somebody <laughs> reach out to one of us reach out to one of us. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. And um, Sonia Dahl at U of O helped me, um, you know, in the beginning, also a workshop um, from Catherine. Um, so taking classes too, I think it's helpful. The other thing I think we forget, and it took me a while to remember, is the loom is digital and it requires troubleshooting. <laughs> so you gotta be a good troubleshooter. Um, because initially something would go wrong. And I, I was just like, oh my, how, what am I gonna do? I can't, you know, I can't stop leaving. And, and then it was like, you, do, you just troubleshoot like you do the computer, it's the same. So getting into a sort of a mode of troubleshooting when you have a problem. And they're also really responsive in Norway. I've had a couple of technical or some technical issues and I just email and they tell me what to, how to figure it out. So they're also a good resource. Um, you know, and, and there's sort of a manual, reading the manual is also helpful. Okay, let's see. Were you working from self-drafted bindings or a database? How much do you, how much do thread systems factor into your concepts? Um, yeah, I mean, how how I learned was was from Lou and how Catherine Amade teaches. I think it's how Joan is working and Raga too, where you work with Photoshop files, um, and within uh, you know when you take Catherine Amade's class, she will give you a certain amount of weave structures um, that you can build files from. Um, you can also, she also teaches you how to uh, build the weave structures yourself so that um, once you start understanding what you're doing, um, then you can build all of your own weave structures within Photoshop. Um, is how I understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you can go in um, being like, I want to use X and such satins, or I want to use, you can kind of, you can build your own um, weave structures um, and then apply them by using a pattern overlay onto your images. Um, so you can, um, there are databases that have, and I have friends um, who we kind of share our weave structures with each other because we'll be like, oh, I, I only built out a set that's, you know, 12, um, or 12 end satin and I would, I'd like to do something that's finer. Do you know, do you have any, you know, three end satin or whatever? You can kind of um, go back through and share files and rebuild files or restructure files. Um, but it seems like um, it's a never ending process of kind of um, making and building new files depending on what it is that you want to um, weave. Yeah, and I did, I've been taking Catherine Amade's class too, and I did ask her, you know, she's been weaving what for, I don't know, uh, a long time. Um, and uh, I asked her if she has all of her weave structures in place now, or if she's still creating new ones. And she said, she's not creating new ones. She has all the weave structures oh, I bet. that she's ever gonna use created in her, database, you know, so there is an end to it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> there is no end. Oh, I got through. 
<laughs> There's never an end. There's an <laughs> end. You told me there was. But one of the things that Catherine said too that really impressed me was um, that that this this medium is just at its infancy. You know, it's just at the very beginning of how she sees artists being able to work with it. And it's just, um, it's just gonna take more and more and more people using it to know what can be done with it because it's just, it is limitless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, great. Well, that is about all the time that we have today, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been such a fantastic panel. Thank you um, to everyone who's from all over the world, from Hawaii to Eugene to here to all the way in Iceland. So I know it's getting quite late there. Um, uh, we will have, there will be a recording available of this presentation for people who want to um, access it later uh, on our archive. I'll go ahead and type in where you can find that in the chat here um, momentarily. Um, we do have a handful of um, events that are coming up, including uh, Tuong Trang, who's going to be with us next week doing a lecture um, and is also using the TC2. So if you, if you want some more TC2 um, content and action uh, join us then so um thank you so much um and uh we will hopefully see you next time thank you everyone bye. thank you bye thank you bye joan Bye. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me, ladies. Awesome. Thank you so much. much. <laughs> I look forward to getting together with all of you yeah. <laughs> and meeting you too, Allison. So. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, so. Your work from the residency is so inspiring. I'm like, how could I do this? We'll meet you in Corvallis and we'll, we'll plan a trip. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It, it is an amazing tool, and it's really, you know, exciting um, to work on it and to be able to transform things as you're working. That's, you know, it's not like weaving traditionally, I don't think, but I'm not a weaver, so. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to seeing all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was so great meeting you finally, and it was so cool hearing about your work and your evolution from digital just messing around on old Macintoshes and everything. <laughs> yeah. That was really cool. Please, so cool. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. my history is different, but it's not like out of the blue. That's what I, that's why I wanted to show the couple things. Yeah, yeah it was really cool. Because yeah, I'm not a weaver either. Neither is Anne. So coming in from different backgrounds and yeah, it was really great meeting you. Yeah, I'll well, have fun in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty nice. <laughs> Please start a residency there so we can all come. <laughs> That's a good idea. There actually is, I was surprised there's a hand weavers group out here. So I'm a part of that. And maybe at the next meeting, I'll tell them they should get a TC too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yay. Well, thank you all so thank much. You yeah. Thank you. Bye. We'll be in Bye. touch. Bye-bye.